network group members which we're hoping to set up during this meeting. Um, there are guest speakers from the six continents who um, need our hearty welcome for coming from, from so far away from uh, North America, South America, China, uh, Australia, South Africa, and we're very lucky to have such distinguished people um, coming to visit us on our campus. Um, and of course then there's most of you here um, who have come who are not part of Cost Action in yes, no, 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 but have shown considerable interest in what we're, what this conference is all about. Um, and uh, we, we welcome you heartily as, as well. And uh, one thing I just need to tell you that I know there are many people uh, being also the first day or the second day of the university term, many people who wanted to be here couldn't be here um, because of teaching commitments and so they've changed their minds. Also I think people who um, were away for Christmas and New Year, so um, although this hall was meant to be absolutely packed, we can see a, quite a few um, spaces which there shouldn't be. That's one of the, uh, I suppose, the problems with having a free conference. We, people don't, if you don't pay for it, then you can use it. <coughs> But I think it's basically after the New Year they realize that they're busy at work and can't, can't take off work. So welcome all of you who have come here today. Um, our, our action, as you can see, is called Cost Action ES1104, Arid Lands Restoration, Combat and Desertification, Setting Up a Dry Lands and Desert Restoration Hub. And when I was, uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually, when I was thinking about it, addressing this conference or, or uh, acting as uh, the chair for this conference, I heard this wonderful program on uh, BBC Radio 4 about the blue marble. And of course, we all know the blue marble. Uh, we don't probably know this image, but we know the image of 1972. And they were talking about the astronauts of Apollo who went up there and for the first time took a photograph of the Earth from space. And I thought, what a wondrous thing that is. And we, we realized, I think we all realized from this, these photographs, the blue marble, how fragile our planet is and people have been working to try and adopt measures um, to, to uh, keep our planet in its pristine condition and to stop the destruction that's happening. But of course, destruction does happen and land degradation does happen um, and desertification does happen. And as far as our action is concerned, there are, I see it as being too wise and I apologize to our members who have seen these slides and probably ones too often. But they are the big whys and the, and, the, and the action why. And first of all, the big why, and this is one of the big whys. We're not talking about restoring deserts that are already there. We're talking about restoring <coughs> the restoration of arid lands or marginal lands, etc. They're places that have been degraded, and so it doesn't support people or, or any other kinds of, of life as well. And of course, this is the big why. This is, of course, a dramatic picture, but in, in extreme circumstances, this is what happens with land degradation. And we also feel it in Europe, and this is why the cost as part of the European funded action is interested in this as well, because we have problems with migration from the Sahel and other regions. We can actually see the sand migration coming from the Sahara, but it's people migration as well. And those people are not coming to Europe because um, they just wouldn't really want to come to Europe. They're in desperate situations. Their lands have been degraded, they can't farm anymore, they end up in a, in a city, let's say, somewhere, they can't make a living and end up coming to Europe in, in hard times. Um, and of course, the effects of desertification are not happening just in the, in the far-flung regions of, of the Earth, in Africa, um, in South America, etc. It's happening on our doorstep, in, um, especially along the northern Mediterranean coast, uh, in Spain, and these are images from some of our colleagues. Uh, we can see here that the, the semi-arid lands and the uh, are, are, are spreading in, in, in Portugal, which is kind of dying. Of course, I don't have pictures of Italy and Greece and Turkey and, 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 and Romania, etc., but it's happening in those areas as well. So why does our action exist? Our action exists because, as a consultant and as a researcher, I found it extremely difficult, and many people have as well, to find information about uh, responding to deserted areas. And I think the information is there many, in many cases, but it's isolated, it's kind of insular, closed. Um, there, there also appear to me to be limited connections between people working in different fields. Um, hydrologists seem to work with hydrologists, I think hydrologists and soil scientists work together, but <coughs> often the cases they don't necessarily work with 
uh, other people, ecologists, scientists, etc. So it's a way of bringing a whole group, a holistic group of people together. So limited connections, also limited connections between practitioners, consultants, and researchers. And there is amazing expertise, of course, in Europe as well as around the world. And Europe could be a focus for leading the world in, in, in this because we have consultants, people working, researchers and academics working all around the world, um, with, of course in conjunction with other local people as well. So the idea is to create this, this font or this uh, place of knowledge to connect and store it, but also to um, make it available, which is very important and also to respond to new challenges and to instigate and facilitate new research, which is one of the things we're going to be discussing in our meeting tomorrow. So uh, this is our, I call it the holistic crew, or we could call them the miscreants, or whoever they are. Some of them here you'll recognize. Um, this is from our second meeting. I, I actually put this up here as well, is because I just wanted to introduce to, uh, this is uh, Simon Berkowitz, who's actually going to be the co-chair to, today. Uh, he's sitting in front here and he's going to help me with starting off uh, questions and asking questions. Uh, but, um, yeah, welcome to you, to you all. Okay, so the Desert Restoration Hub really is, is, is about practical solutions. Uh, it's also about the science. We're bringing to the practical solutions about uh, establishing, establishing vegetation, but also about, of course, managing it for long-term uh, benefits for ecology, landscape, and, and wildlife. Um, as part of this action, we have the thing called the Desert Restoration Hub, which is the website which we're using to um, uh, store our, our information, put information, and act as a blog. And this is www.desertrestorationhub.com. And um, one of the things I put the slide up was as well because part of this action, which is very important, and a key part of it, is about education and research and getting people across Europe and, and, and more extended because we can do it with Australia, mm -hmm. South Africa, Argentina and, and elsewhere, um, getting people involved in training schools, so the cost will pay for a certain amount of funds for, for training schools where people can go to a particular country as a group and do some certain kind of research or, or to learn some new techniques which they wouldn't be able to use at, uh, do at their own university. And there's also the thing called short-term uh, uh, short-term sustainable scientific missions, which uh, Simon is also in control of, um, and um, we, for example, our first one has happened between uh, uh, Vera Fiera went from the Algarve in Portugal to Switzerland uh, in um, in Bern and did some work there as well, and we're hoping to grow that as well. Okay, so that's basically. I'm going to be able to talk to you very, uh, during the day. Uh, we have a couple of tea breaks, we have uh, lunch, we're providing lunch, of course, for our management committee members. I'm sorry that our budget doesn't extend to providing lunch for, for everybody. But um, when I was thinking about finding a celebrity or somebody um, with some clout to kind of help me with the opening of this uh, conference and our meeting, um, I actually invited one of the ministers of the environment, and of course they've got um, better, things, better things to do, and it was probably too late notice. But I noticed that Dr. Nick Middleton was, uh, was coming to the conference, and he's, as you can see, he's from the University of Oxford. And most of you in the UK would know Nick from um, his TV series on, I think it was Channel 4, um, and um, delight, delightful programs. But there's a, a, a very serious side to Nick, um, Nick's research, and he's been involved in, in desert research uh, for many a year. And I'll just read a little bit from um, the website there, it says that Nick main, Nick's main research interest is, the, is in the nature and human use of deserts and their margins, environments, commonly referred to collectively as drylands. His publications in this area include The Forgotten Billion, uh, Millennium Development of Gold Achievements in the, in the Drylands, and this is one of the latest books uh, or publications. In fact, I think it is available on the web for in a PDF form for free, so you can download it. But Nick's been involved in uh, arid lands and uh, uh, responsive to desertification, etc., for a very long time. Um, you can see the list of his publications, and there are many more. And so I'm very happy that Nick has uh, agreed to give us a, a, a five minute uh, talk and discussion about um, his take on, um, on, on what's happening in terms of desertification and, and uh, What's happened over the year? So thank, thank you, Nick. Hello, good morning. 
I'm the uh, warm-up app, if you like. Uh, I've only got five minutes or so, and we're running late already. So um, Ben's asked me to start by saying a few words about what inspired me to uh, be interested in dry land. And the answer to that probably applies to many people in this uh, room, was my university tutor, uh, Andrew Cowley, whom many of you will uh, know. He was my tutor in the 1980s, sent me to North Africa to do uh, an undergraduate dissertation, and subsequently went to several other dry lands to do my doctorate. Uh, I'm born and brought up in this country. I'm a, a mid-latitude man, if you like. And um, I'm not afraid to say that the, the attractions of drylands for me were the very different environments, the wide open spaces, the exoticism for me, and the feeling in many of them of being at a frontier, on the edge, both ecologically speaking and from the point of view of society. And that fascination has continued uh, while I'm wearing my academic hat. Uh, I also wear other hats in, in other lives. I'm a travel writer and documentary filmmaker. And throughout uh, my career, deserts and dry lands in general have held a special place for me. Uh, Ben's asked me to, to uh, highlight a few of the changes that I've seen since I've been working uh, on dry lands. And I've noted four main areas, and sure there are many others, but here are four areas that uh, come to my mind. Uh, one is on terminology. I, I've lost count of the number of times I've written that desertification as a word, as a term, was first used in 1949 by the French forester Aubreville. Um, but now, for, for those of us who are interested in the origins of the word, um, it's been traced uh, further back still by Diana Davis. Um, to the mid-19th century, and not in West Africa, but in Africa north of the Sahara, but still French colonialists. Um, terminology about desertification and the way it's framed has also seen a marked change, and it's a change, I think, that applies to several other big environmental issues. Um, well, I was involved in writing the first World Atlas of Desertification, which was a, a document for a RIA, UNSED, of 1992. And in the early 90s, uh, desertification was most definitely framed as a problem. It still is, but that word is not used nearly as commonly as today as it was uh, in those days, 20 years plus ago. And we've seen a, a sort of transition from framing it as a problem to a less emotive word like issue. Um, and then the word issue has given way to challenge. And now some people even refer to combating desertification as an opportunity. And although it, we're playing with words and it's semantics, the way the issue is framed has changed quite significantly and in quite an interesting way. So it's no longer purely as a negative type problem that we have to deal with, and it's become almost full circle, if you like, um, to seeing it as a challenging opportunity. The second uh, area that I've identified which has most definitely changed in the last 20 plus years is um, the agencies in, in the international and multilateral arena that deal with des desertification. When I was first interested in it, um, everything revolved around DC PAC, that some of you will remember, Desertification Control Program Activity Center, which was a UNEP body based in Nairobi. That ceased to exist. Um, the position of desertification as an issue uh, uh, among UNEP bureaucrats is not nearly as high as it was in those days. And there's a good reason for that, because we have the UNCCD, which came into force in, in 1996. But the, the, the big multilateral and international arbiters of desertification have most definitely changed. I also um, don't remember, I may be wrong, but I don't remember the EU having much of a role uh, in desertification as an issue in the early 
90s. It is now, and that's why we're here today. Um, access is the third aspect of the issue which has most definitely changed. Um, if we go back 20 plus years, 1990 was a watershed when suddenly for researchers, certainly in, in Western countries, the whole of Central Asia and Mongolia and, and large parts of China too, I may say, suddenly opened up and became available um, for Westerners to work and do research in. And the access and accessibility of drylands uh, is a continually changing mosaic, but there are some areas that are certainly much easier to work in today than they were 20 plus years ago. By contrast, equally, some places haven't changed at all, sadly. You think about Somalia, which felt a bit 20 plus years ago, Afghanistan, um, still very difficult places uh, to do research in. Uh, other places that have, have, have certainly got a higher profile today than they did 20 plus years ago. Uh, China, there's a lot more research coming out of China than there was 20 years ago. Uh, Latin America too. Um, I remember trying uh, very hard to find people to contribute to the World Atlas of Desertification second edition in the mid 90s um, from Latin America and it was rather difficult. But I'm pleased to say that there's a lot more active Drylands research going on in that part of the world. Although there are still places where you see very little, like northeast Brazil, for example. Um, having mentioned Afghanistan, Somalia, no one uh, is researching much in northern Mali today uh, for obvious reasons, and security and, and the issues surrounding it have become one of the, the hot topics for, for drylands research in, in recent years. And that's one of these fashions that come and go, but it's certainly a hot topic uh, right now. Um, allied to this ease of access is the much more widespread use of um, <coughs> GPS and much more widely available satellite imagery, which again makes working in drylands and their margins uh, much easier today than it was 20 years ago. And actually, in, in that regard, I remember um, trying to get access to the Gobi Desert in Mongolia uh, in the 1980s uh, when it was still a Soviet satellite state and it took me five years to get a visa. Eventually they let me in but they wouldn't let me out of the Alberta. Today I'm involved in uh, a research project in the Gobi on both sides of the border in both Mongolia and China and you can go more or less anywhere at all in Mongolia. <coughs> Uh, the final um, area that I'd like to highlight as being rather different now than 20 plus years ago is uh, in the approach to desertification as a, an issue. Uh, certainly 20 plus years ago it was framed uh, around this problem word and it was very much regarded as a, a physical issue that could be fixed technically. And I'm pleased to say that that has changed quite significantly in the intervening years. And now we view desertification as a, a, a facet of social and ecological systems combined and acting in synergy. And that's to be welcomed without question. And I'm sure that that will come through um, many of the presentations today. One thing that uh, most definitely hasn't changed uh, in the last 20, 25 years is the importance of timing. I'm out of time and I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think the last trip, you, you've just been to China and whatever it is, 
and I've tried to get Jim to come to this to this conference, and he's always been away. So I'm, we're very happy and delighted to have uh, Jim here today. And uh, you, of course, got the um, um, the biographies are small, short, short biographies of uh, uh, of people on the back here. So I won't repeat it, but I'll just say that Jim's James is a, is a renowned figure, um, and he is a professor of environmental science and biology at the Nicholas School of Environment Duke University. Um, and uh, we welcome him here today and um, um, give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for the introduction, Vince. Uh, I've had two surprises already this morning. The, the first is a pleasant one, is that the clocks work, which is what I expect being at, at Greenwich. And do, there's not a single clock in any classroom that actually works. So that's uh, pleasant. And the second one is that you were unable to get a bureaucrat to open the meeting, but rather you had Professor Middleton, which is, uh, I think, a real treat for, for all of us. He's next made a, lot, a very profound contribution to the field of desertification and dry land degradation. So it's a real pleasure for me to uh, listen to his comments. My uh, presentation today is a fairly general one, but my, my theme, it, there's two parts to my talk, and my, my overall theme is that we always, we must, as Nick, as uh, Vince pointed out, we must always consider the human and the environmental interactions. Land de degradation is an extraordinarily complex problem. Hence, that's one of the, the reasons we've had so many issues with, with the terminology that's been used, the word desertification has been used as a noun, a verb, an adjective, a preposition. It's, it's used in every way, almost making it meaningless in terms of its actual usage, uh, out, particularly outside the scientific community. So my theme is the human-environmental interaction. And the first part of my talk is going to be on talking about the Dust Bowl in the United States. Uh, it's been, uh, it was an extraordinary uh, problem, and I, I think I couldn't think of a better theme uh, talk, thinking about the, the tempest here in, the, in England, in that since we're talking about land degradation, it's a classic tale of betrayal, revenge, and hopefully redemption. And uh, in, in the, the tempest, there's a, a saying, I think Antonio uh, makes a statement, where, at, where of what's past is prologue. Uh, roughly, interpreted as the, is the past a good predictor of the future? The past, where we've been, is a good indication of where we're going. And that will be the, <coughs> one of the, the major themes of my presentation today. The second part of my talk, I will take you on a trip down to Bolivia and give you another example of human environmental interactions. These are, are just sound bites since we have a very short period of time. But hopefully I'll, I'll, uh, my, my comments will resonate with you. The, the Dust Bowl recently, uh, I've always thought I, I knew a lot about the Dust Bowl, but recently we had a, a wonderful uh, program in November from public television by Ken Burns, and you can look watch this on the web, uh, called the Dust Bowl, and he, he chronicled the, uh, one of the, what he calls the, the worst uh, man-made ecological disaster in American history. And what's really interesting, I, I read a lot about this in recent months, and since that program, I got the book and I started reading about it and I found it really fascinating. And I've been thinking of actually looking at it, this past problem in terms of current problems now that are happening, hence the past is prologue uh, statement. The, I'm going to give you a, a really quick overview of the, the so-called Great Plow Up, which is, was uh, the wheat boom in the United States, followed by the decade-long drought, and how all these Social, economic, and ecological factors, inter and meteorological factors, all interacted to lead to this catastrophe. <clears throat> the uh, Dust Bowl took place uh, roughly in this region of the, of the United States. It really, of course, its impact was felt throughout the country, but it mainly was in the southeastern uh, uh, area of the United States, uh, covering a lot of different kinds of grassland types. Grasslands are much more extensive than just what's shown here. We have uh, different types of arid and semi-arid uh, desert grasslands, high alpine grasslands, short uh, 
annual type grasslands in uh, California. So there's a lot of diversity of grasslands in the United States. But this was the main area of the dust bowl. The great plow up. Well, of course, during the colonization of the, the Midwest the United States, the, it started in the late 1890s. But in the 1910s and 1920s, it was a, a very unique time because the climate was very satisfactory. It was nice and moist. Uh, the wheat prices were, were skyrocketing. World War I was happening. So there was a great market for all this. And there was one of these classic booms where a lot of speculation went on. And of course, we all know about bubbles. In this case, it was a land bubble. So because of this, it was a catch-22, or, or actually a, a, a positive feedback. More and more land was plowed under to try to take advantage of this. And there is what's really important to understand is, is the mindset of the people in the country during these days. There was this concept that free enterprise in particular was this industrial revolution and the uh, capitalistic approach in the United States was something to really take advantage of. And as a result, there was a lot of compromising of con basic conservation principles. There were people who came in, they called them suitcase farmers, you know, absentee landowners, people who didn't really care about uh, long-term sustainability, but rather just to make a quick buck. And even many farmers who had heretofore always conserved were very careful about the sustainability of their land, the resilience of their land, basically decided to make a quick buck as everyone else was doing it. And these types of, this type of mindset really prevailed during these years, and it led, in part, to the problems that, that we see. It's really interesting, I, I found this quote from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Soils. The soil is one indestructible, immutable asset that the nation possesses. It's a resource that cannot be exhausted, it just can't be used up. This was in 1909. And I'm sure there's people today who would say the same thing. Well, as I said, a boom and then bust. The, the idea, what happened here was, of course, a big, great depression happened. I was talking about in the early 20s, moving on, all these perfect conditions for, for the boom, for the, the bubble. The great depression happened, the market collapsed, a lot of land was left abandoned, uh, people no longer could uh, afford to farm, there was no market for, their, the, for the wheat. And then, of course, combined with the environmental aspects of the, in this case, the drop of the 30s, led to this human ecological disaster. It's a much more complex story than this, but these are sort of the, the headlines of what led to this. So it's a combination of economic, social, ecological, and uh, meteorological factors that all led to this disaster. And a lot of very, the human system mainly had a major role in, in this uh, issue. Now, some of the, the well-known photographs and so forth uh, are things such as the, the dust storms in the Texas Panhandle, the uh, dust storms that were extraordinary in terms of their scope and how they impacted the human health. And uh, people could not even shake hands because of the dryness of the air. This, they, because they would have static electricity, they, would, they couldn't even do that. It was uh, really quite a unique time. And I will point out right now that in 2012, we had the second worst drought since the 1930s in terms of uh, many different parameters involved. And obviously this led to, uh, as Vince pointed out, a lot of people uh, in the United States, in this case, migrated to find, uh, just to survive. And hence the, the novel by Steinbeck, The Grapes, uh, Grapes and Wrath, uh, came out of this. And a lot of people moved to California. Uh, from all over the, the United States, but largely from the, the Dust Bowl region. And I mentioned that the dust storms, uh, not only did it affect their local area, but of course, as we know, dust storms really have a huge impact in many, many areas. And it wasn't until they started impacting the Washington, D.C. area that, <laughs> that the government really started recognizing the extent of these problems. And I think that's the case also in Beijing because of the the, the dust that hits Beijing now, I think that's really motivated the government there to throw a lot of money at this problem, foolishly in many cases. So, what is to come? 
This is a story, uh, a bit of a cautionary tale, as a matter of fact, about the way we treat our land. And the science was there, but it was ignored. Because there's a certain thing that we do as a society. Uh, this attitude that existed there really became more important and dominated the activities of people rather than the science. And that's something to keep in mind, how these types of factors have a major role in land degradation throughout the world. We, in many cases, understand the science. At least we understand enough to make uh, decisions that can manage lands in the short term, and even in the near term, maybe not the long term completely. But we have the science. What's happening now is, after the Dust Bowl, and I can't go into many of the details here, but we. The Aqualala uh, aquifer now was all of a sudden they started putting windmills in it and they could start getting groundwater from this uh, aquifer that filled up during the Ice Age. It's a massive, massive aquifer. And of course, uh, at first they used windmills, so a little bit of water was pumped up, no big deal. But today, now there's competing farmers and they're pumping out water at extraordinary rates and depleting the, the uh, aquifer. And this now is leading to serious restrictions. I was reading just the other day in uh, the Dallas uh, newspaper, I was to Dallas-Fort Worth, and they were talking about the, all the restrictions down the amount of water that farmers can <coughs> pull out from the, from the aquifer. And of course, this is causing lots of political and social upheaval and so forth. So the question is, will the past repeat itself? Just a, a, a couple months ago, in October, there was a massive dust storm in Oklahoma. And uh, it was really interesting. Again, I, I listened to a comment from uh, the Secretary of uh, Agriculture, Jim uh, Rees from Oklahoma. He was asked a question about, well, is it possible that the 1930s Dust Bowl the situation could repeat itself because of the aquifer and so forth? And as you can see, what it, his comment was, that will never happen again. But yet, we're in a situation where it's very easy for me to see how we're, we're reproducing the conditions that led to the initial principle. <clears throat> and again, I, my theme here is to keep in mind that we sort of understand a lot of the fundamentals, what leads to these problems, but we tend to repeat our mistakes. Now, I, I'm going to now move down to South America for my second example. And my eye on the clock there, which I'm sure is correct. <laughs> uh, my colleagues and I, a few years ago, we, we presented a, something called the Drylands Development Paradigm. It's uh, made up of, uh, it consists of five principles. The first principle is that you must always, if you're going to look at land degradation and desertification, and you're looking for understanding the driving factors, you're trying to understand the, the causal factors, you're trying to understand solutions and so forth, the first thing you have to do is make sure you always look at the human and the environmental environment together. We're talking about coupled human environmental systems. These are coupled human, economic, social, environmental systems. If you leave any of those factors out, you're not going to understand the holistic view of what's going on. And I think my Dust Bowl example is a really good one to illustrate that. The second principle is that you're not going to be able to study everything. That's just impossible. So the, the key factor is you, you have to try, you have to understand what are the major underlying variables that are important. And we call these slow variables. These are factors that change very slowly. The simplest example is like you looking at soil fertility in an area would give you a good index of what's going to happen the next year and the following year. It would give you some kind of feel for it. On the other hand, if you look at just soil water content, that's going to change from year to year. Or even the amount of, of forage produced, that's going to vary with rainfall. So that's the fast variable. So the second principle is you have to, and also social economic variables, fast and slow are also quite important. The third principle is that when you look at these variables, and you look at the whole system, there's going to be thresholds involved. The Dust Bowl is a great example of finding different in the, the aquifer issue about how much can you push a system, what is the system resilience, and how far can you push that before you reach a threshold 
and you move the system to a new state. And if you move it to a new state, is it can you recover that system? And this is what the Restoration Hub is all about, of trying to look at systems that are in various states of degradation and in some cases try to move it back to, a, to another state. So thresholds are really crucial. The fourth principle, and we looked at these principles throughout North and South America in this network called ErinNet. The fourth principle is that you have to look at it from a systems principle. That is, what's happening at one level of interest is impacted by something higher and something lower. And these are all very straightforward principles, but when you put them all together, it's really very crucial. You can get a much, it's pretty encompassing in terms of trying to understand the true dynamics of what's going on in the system. So the fourth principle is that uh, this, you're looking at a system. So you have to look at interactions, cross interactions, feedbacks, and so forth. Then the last principle that's also quite important is, is that local environmental knowledge is really important. Not just scientific knowledge, but combining it with the knowledge of the people who live there and working with them to better understand uh, the dynamics of these systems. So we, given those principles, we, we studied a variety of different sites throughout North and South America. And I'm going to give you an example of the Solaria Uni in, in Bolivia. And we're now expanding area into China and eventually into Africa and other parts of the world. Now, the Solaria Uni is this uh, area in the Alto Plano of, uh, of Bolivia. It's, this is the largest uh, salt bed in the entire world. It's an absolutely fantastic area, very high elevation. This is about uh, 4,000. No, actually, this might be five, I, I don't remember, obviously, three or four. 5,000 meters right here. And the Alto Plano itself is in part of, a, of a Peru and Bolivia. It's about 600 miles long and it's all high elevation. And there's a lot of indigenous people who live in this area. And there's many factors that are now contributing to changes in this environment. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The farm communities, in particular this one at Salarda Uni, they grow a quinoa. And some of you probably had quinoa for breakfast this morning. And uh, it's a quinopodon. This is an indigenous plant. And it's native to the Andes region. It's, uh, the, it's called the mother grain in the Inca language. The conquistadors, when they came through, they called it, the, they called it the, the golden plant. It has a very high, up to 20% protein in the, in the, the seeds. So it's an extraordinarily a wonderful plant. And it's been a part of this diet of the local people for over 5,000 years. And it does remain a very important uh, crop, uh, but probably for very different reasons that you might think today. <clears throat> not sure where that came from. <laughs> so uh, quinoa is, uh, there's, uh, I took this picture, I, I, I found this area where they had all these different varieties of quinoa. It's really quite extraordinary. All the different varieties that are, that are grown in this region. Uh, and they put all these sacks up for me and we, we label them and so forth. They're really fantastic. Well, what's happening in the Alto Plano today? Well, you here in, in Europe and me in North America, we have a hunger for quinoa. And all of a sudden you could go to grocery mm -hmm. stores and all throughout North America and Europe, and you see quinoa bars, uh, organic quinoa. Uh, and when I was there, the few people now who still eat quinoa, uh, instead of cornflakes, there in Bolivia, are they, they, it's a very intensive preparation for the, for the city itself. And it's an extraordinary plant. But now, there's a tremendous commercial demand for that from Europe and North America, from uh, North America. And as a result, there's now extensive development of land that have nev has never been touched before by certainly not a tractor. These are a very recent introduction. And incidentally, that was something I didn't, I failed to mention about the Dust Bowl. Uh, people were using tractors to start exploiting marginal lands because of the high price of grains and so forth. That also is a serious problem. And this is also quite marginal. These are all land-fed agriculture, the quinoa. And the development now is absolutely extraordinary. 
So I'm going to give you a little uh, arrow, a box and arrow diagram here of the dynamics of what's happening there in the Alto Pondo, certainly in the Salarda Uni region of Bolivia. So we have quinoa, and there's this tremendous demand now, and because of the demand, there is increased area of cultivation, thousands of miles away. And this increased uh, cultivation has led to various NGOs, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, many other foreign countries have provided funding to buy tractors. So tractors have never been a part of these, uh, these villages, these communities. I, I lived there with some of these people, and it's extraordinary the changes that this has introduced. And so now massive areas now are being plowed and cultivated. So, of course, the more land you, you uh, develop and sell your product, the more money you make. The more money you have, the more tractors you can buy. And, of course, the more tractors you buy, the more land you can, can uh, start plowing up. And what happens then, and we already are seeing extraordinary examples of this, you see water, wind erosion, decreases in soil fertility, but it sounds like the Dust Bowl, doesn't it? <coughs> but what is really troubling, and one of the most shocking things that I learned from my colleagues, uh, my Bolivian colleagues, are the changes in the social structure and the fabric of these indigenous communities. The decreases in, in, in cooperation between the communities now, and rather, which has now been replaced by competition. But even more uh, extraordinary, are the, the loss of the local customs in terms of their dependence on, uh, on quinoa as their staple in their diet. And I, I can tell you, I saw all the men my age and older and slightly younger, all were extraordinarily fit. They, could, they were like gazelles up when, when they took us out in the field and going up in the hills and so forth. All the young kids, yes, I'm making a big generalization, but I saw it in my own eyes were obese in many cases, had terrible teeth from teeth to decay, and big semi-trucks pulled out into these isolated areas. So we used 4 by 4s to get into, and they, they had a Pepsi-Cola on the side of the truck and Coca-Cola, and they were bringing out all these uh, sugars and different things that were never part of the local customs before, but now people can afford that, and that's what's happening. So the grand sum of all of this is that we're seeing a tremendous change driven by the demand for this uh, economic product from thousands of miles away is driving a tremendous change in the local uh, customs, the social fabric, the economic structure of, of these areas. And many of the people we talk to are interested in making as much money as they can, which I truly understand, because farming is hard work. And they want to send their children to university, and then that their children can take care of them in old age. This is, Elena can talk more about this and speak more of this in terms of how prevalent this is in Latin America. But in our experience, we've seen lots of examples of this, and it's quite prevalent in Bolivia. So my, I'll end with this note here that uh, if we look at the full quote from the Tempest, it's where what's past is prologue what to come in yours and my discharge. So it's not only about <coughs> the events of the past, but also how are we going to address these problems. We have control over these problems. We had control over the Dust Bowl. We have control over so many of these problems that are leading to these issues that exist today, but we tend to fail to act in a way that is judicious in terms of obtaining a sustainable system. It's not a lack of understanding, it's a lack of desire. It's motivated by other factors. And that to me is one of the biggest challenges that we face. And we can keep doing our science, but we have to get other people involved as well who are help us with these other factors. They're equally important. Thank you very much. to open up the floor to questions. In fact, thank you, Jim. You can have to use this once. Okay. <laughs> We're on time. You can see I took out a whole bunch of slides. That's okay.
uh, question for the I, I would really love to hear your presentation. It would be very interesting. And I agree 100% with you that we have to... Just identify you. yourself. Just, uh, just identify uh, yourself for the audience. Just name your, your uh, name so where I'm you're from. So, um, I know I've been many years in Mexico. And I saw exactly the same things which you described in Bolivia. But I think there is one step in between. It is normal that people want to go forward to send the children to university and the tractor right. and the big area uh, working on is the, is the green condition for this. But what I was seeing and thinking is if we just give them the tractor and say, okay, now we, we, we buy a product, if, if we are able and we know the techniques how to protect the soils, even though we are doing it, a big scale industrial agriculture. So what I was seeing and what we were trying to do there is to introduce at the same moment as you get the tractors there to introduce protection techniques mm -hmm. for the soils. And in the other way around, I think then we have the money to buy all these McDonald's and all these Coca-Cola things. You know, I saw the same thing with these fat uh, boys and yeah, but this as well is a form. They want to go forward. And I think this is the State. Because they have the money, but they are still not educated in a way to know what is really good in long term. That's an excellent point. I will remind you though that even in the Dust Bowl days, there were many farmers who were practice safe conservation practices that they just, because of the allure of making a lot of money over a short period of time, it's Human beings, we tend to have this extraordinary weakness for money, and it's a great opportunity. And they were many of them have been compromised. So yes, I'm sure you're absolutely right. What it's not impossible to introduce at the same time the practice, good practices. But the question is, for the local people, is that what their motivation is? Is long-term sustainability or short-term profits? That's always the, the challenge that we're faced with. Yeah. And as well the transformation of the ideas. Uh -huh. Yeah, we give them. Is, is eating hamburger and Coca-Cola a sign of richness right. or of stupidness? Yeah. You know? I, I won't comment on that because I, I have my opinion. <laughs> yes. Paul oh, Gabriel from the University of Ghent in Belgium. And I like your uh, comparison between the first ball. I studied in uh, Iowa at Berlin and a uh, and, uh, and project in uh, Japan on uh, Kinoa. Uh, I have a project already for some years. I asked you the question, and oh. the Union University remember, what's really wrong with those people having practice? Because I, we have a project already in Kiowa, on Mountain Plano. I just come back in uh, November from a meeting with the unions, the foreign unions, in Mountain Plano, most of our ladies. That's right. That's right. No, that's right. One of there were 60 people, only one farmer had a practice. Only one farm. 95% is planting by hand in pits. They, they, they use some organic matter. And now we have a project on deficit irrigation. You are, you are right that the big problem is planting irrigation. What is the big problem there? It's wind erosion. Also, you are the same as the small potatoes. Wind erosion is the main problem. But you cannot grow trees there because you are 4,000 4, meters high. So you have to do something against wind erosion. And then they buy tractors. Then they have a lot of income. What can we do also? The United States also have tractors. Tra tra you said that. You said that. Oh, yeah. we, cannot, we cannot change that. That's what they do. And the main crop is not quinoa in the multi People have a wrong idea. It's potatoes. That's the main crop. Yeah. And quinoa is, of course, the potosie. They have very grow for food. But the rest is have potatoes. All the whole of the and not quinoa. The people have a wrong, a wrong idea. The quinoa, the big grains are just for food. And the small grains are exported to the United States and mainly to Japan. That's the thing. To of, uh, of Japan and Europe, Europe and the United States. Some people have a false idea of what's happening in Kiowa. You showed some picture in the tractor. That's, that's correct. I've seen also that. But if this farm did not know how much this tractor weighs, what is the pressure of these tires, they don't know. And we just introducing combating desertificates. That's what we are doing, taking action. Not just talking what they cannot do, but we should give them some advice how to combat this that they said. If they can do it because they are lacking of water there, scarcity of water, so they, are, they need bits, they need water, and they need also some conservation of the sea that people. Thank you very much. Yeah.
Come clear at the back. 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 Yes. Everybody. Stand up. Hear you. Okay. Did you stand up? Please. Can you stand up? Yes. yes. And address everybody. I am Elena Danforo from Argentina. The only thing that I want to know is uh, what's about the order, please. Where are the where the patterns? What the real money? The real money? Mm -hmm. About the the order, please. The patterns. For Kenya. For Kenya. Well, my economic colleague who's working down there now could answer that more uh, efficiently than me, sure. But the farmers, like in any system, you have many, many different levels of, from the farm to the, uh, once they do their harvesting and so forth, which is a lot of manual labor, even though they do have now electricity and, and uh, power generators and so forth. And then they have to ship this in to, uh, they have people there now, a lot of trucks coming in who are collecting this, they take it into the cities, they have different kind of processing plants, it's very intensive to produce that, the final product. You have, there's a lot of steps involved. And so the money trickles down, you, you know, the farmer obviously is making a profit, but a few dollars is, is really great for some of these people, whereas the big dollars, I'm sure, is at the, the end, the big market. I'm not sure if that's the question you were asking, but yes, you know, there's. Because, uh, I don't know if there's anything unique about this system compared to any other type of. You always speak about the inner causes and the external causes right. of the certification in Canada. Right. I think the real causes are not of manipulation, are not in the in the body of the place, but in other parts of the world. The real causes. Yes, the real causes. Thousands of the stuff like Oh, that's a lot. Excuse me for my language. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, in this case, I, I was pointing out that the, the drivers here is the demand for the king one, which comes from international demand. Okay. One last question. Yes, sir. Jose Luis Rubio from the Desertification of Reserve Center in Valencia, Spain. Thank you for your presentation. You made very important references to the past. You mentioned the, the sentence from Chester, and also you mentioned the past as predictor of the future. And I would like to know from you, maybe it's too personal, your, your feeling for the future. Uh, a kind of summary of sentence that you think that we will make uh, again a strong component, or there is some for optimism or hope? That's a profound type of question. My answer probably will be less than profound. I'm, I'm concerned that I know in the United States we're a crisis oriented society. We don't do anything until there's a crisis. The Dust Bowl is a great example of that. We don't do anything until it's, it's already there. And I think that's becoming more and more the case throughout the world. I think the, the days of visionary leaders, we need new people. I'm optimistic if we can, if people will elect and try to get good visionary leadership, then I think, I, I believe all of our problems are solvable, but we just have to have the desire to do that. As long as we remain crisis oriented, I'm, I'm, I do worry about the future for my grandchildren and yours. Thank you. I'll just ask a question in general to the audience to be thought about perhaps by the end of the day, which is, what is the role of government then in intervening, controlling, looking at carrying capacities of areas, not just in North America, but areas at risk? Because if we increase the population, even with good management, and suddenly there is a drought, disasters, we suddenly have to take care of a doubling of population, and we may in fact be setting ourselves up for a bigger fall. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, I just I just had a take on, on <coughs> tractors and and, uh, and uh, planting and stuff like that. And I know that no tool uh, planting or agriculture does work. And I you know I don't know if it works in that situation, but it works in other countries. I don't see why you know they have to actually plow it up and they can just you know, spot spot drill uh, the seeds. But perhaps that wouldn't work. Okay, so we're moving now from uh, North America to South America. 
And in the same way as I introduced uh, James or Jim Reynolds, um, Elena Ma uh, uh, Maria Abraham, who is from Argentina in Mendoza in, uh, in Argentina, I think she's probably had the longest trip here today. And uh, um, I think she arrived uh, yesterday evening a little bit frazzled because she was meant to arrive at City Airport and then, then ended up in Heathrow after a 24-hour trip. So uh, you know, that takes a lot of strength and courage to, to come here. But again, a little bit like, like Jim, I think when I, when I, I look for people, to, uh, experts, to come and help us in our, uh, in our endeavors in terms of uh, solutions and talking about desertification, etc., uh, Elena's name kept coming up, and uh, uh, everybody seems, you know, anybody who's anybody in the kind of field of combating desertification, of arid lands, restoration, etc., uh, Elena's there, and she's uh, on UN CCD bodies, on a Desert Net International, and all, the, all those kinds of uh, bodies. So, um, Elena is the Director General of EADISA. Um, in South America and uh, lots of other things as well. She's a specialist in desert desertification research, and she'll tell us a little bit more about that. And so, uh, a very big welcome to you, Elena. We're very happy to that you've come all this way from uh, 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 Argentina <coughs> via Chile, by Madrid, and by Israel. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs>
and productive activities are developed in the oasis, while 1.5 hectares, nearly 40% of the oasis areas shows southernization and water loading. 